Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless elon musk has become somewhat of an improbable pro-freedom voice with his open opposition to unchecked borders and exposing militant COVID censorship and misinformation he's even said the quiet part out loud about electric vehicles needing massive increases in power generation in the u.s that our grid is presently not prepared to produce. Heralding the first chip implanted into the human brain as a great leap forward for technology might temper some of that conservative enthusiasm. Neuralink, as it is called, raises serious concerns about a host of issues impacting bioethics and personal freedom. Musk and other developers interested in cybernetic implants must be open to strict regulation of this technology, even if it means it won't be profitable or stunts its advance. Failure to address those issues in law and public policy could eviscerate society as we know it. The first version of Neuralink called telepathy allegedly enables people to control their phones and their computers or almost any device just by thinking. Musk posting on X said, quote, initial users will be those who have lost the use of their limbs. Imagine if Stephen Hawking could communicate faster than a speed typist or auctioneer. That's the goal. But the road to perdition is paved with good intentions. We're simply not mature enough, folks, as a species to even be remotely ready for this. And we won't be in five or ten years either. The ability to control devices with thoughts sounds cool. But like the Borg in Star Trek, such technology could also be used to manipulate and monitor individuals or create a hive mindset. We are a Borg. Resistance is futile. We have already won. Look at us. Without free will, folks, we are nothing but drones. Considering that tech companies already manipulate what uses see and hear while selling your personal data, which they cannot keep secure from cyber criminals, the risks associated with implants are obvious. The goal of achieving some form of symbiosis with artificial intelligence is a threat to free will and participatory government. It's the kind of technology communists and authoritarians would love to exploit to control their populations and attack their enemies. Elon Musk has made it abundantly clear that his overall ambition is to achieve symbiosis with artificial intelligence to become one with AI. We need to look at this news through the lens of biblical prophecy. To see this through a prophetic lens, we have to understand that Satan wants to be like God, and he wants to be worshipped as God, as we read in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan is the great counterfeiter of God. And in the last days, he will do this in a number of ways. God is his own children, as we read in John 1, 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Satan has his own brand of children, as we read in Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Jesus chose 12 apostles, as we read in Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Satan has his own apostles, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
God will demonstrate his seal of ownership on his servants in the end days with a mark on their foreheads, as we read in Revelation 7, 2-4. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Satan will do the same, as we read in Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Satan has created his own false trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, which mirror God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. God is all-knowing, as we read in Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Satan will be all-knowing through complete connectivity when man merges with artificial intelligence. Everything you see will have a chip recording data in real time and sending it to a global brain. The Antichrist will know essentially when a sparrow falls to the ground and the number of hairs on your head. Neuralink promises to give sight to the blind, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, those oppressed from schizophrenia, seizures, autism, or any other brain disorders will be healed. The promises of Neuralink sound very similar to the miracles of our Lord Jesus, as we read in Luke 7, 19-22. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. We, as the body of Christ, need to be awake and aware of the signs of the times that we live in. We need to stay in the Word of God and make sure that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. To be fair, Mr. Musk isn't alone in advancing technology that could lead to a dystopian future for Americans and billions around the world. After all the psychological damage done by social media and increased screen time, online pornography, all substantiated by hard scientific data and anecdotal evidence, Apple and Meta are throwing out the science with new ways to sap the soul out of living. Leftist Mark Zuckerberg, who once asked Communist President Xi Jinping of China to name his unborn child, is dumping billions into the creation of his Metaverse and Quest 3 goggles. He may be apologizing for the damage done by social media to young people. Don't kid yourself, he's not nearly done doing damage yet. This immersive experience will have significant mental health impacts by ultimately allowing users to divorce themselves from reality through the creation of virtual lives and communities. The first version of the metaverse didn't exactly take off, but Zuckerberg is still investing heavily into the program, ultimately expect that it will be much more realistic and user-friendly. That will mean, as psychologists have already warned, more disassociation, more antisocial behavior, heightened negative emotion, addiction, and more anxiety. Expect the clever marketing that downplays the risks and the damage of the metaverse to make the misinformation campaigns of the marijuana companies look like little white lies. Apple's Tim Cook is now pushing Apple Vision Pro. These wearable screens create a physical barrier with the real world as well. Cook and Apple are also joined at the hip with communist China. They're going to tell you that it's all in fun, that it'll have great utility to make life more efficient, transport people to far-flung places, or help take education to a whole new level. But like any drug that impacts brain function, this will lead to more dependency and an overall deadening of the human spirit. Folks, 
We were meant to live in a three-dimensional world. Our spirits fed by interactions with each other's physical presence. Both the Old and New Testaments reference the importance of our eyes, what we see, what we choose to see, how they express our emotions. They are windows to the soul. Tech titans, of course, will accuse elected officials of regulating so-called progress. But this isn't building a, build, a taller building or a faster car or a bigger supercomputer. These technologies reach into the very core of the human mind. They challenge the soul and they can strip away the essence of living. To think otherwise is to be as ignorant of reality as these technologies could one day make all of us. In the 1999 movie, Apocalypse 2 Revelation, we watched as the Antichrist oversaw the mark of the beast using a VR headset. Whoever thought 25 years later, the world would be living in this type of reality. This reality is brought to us by the company whose first computer sold for $666.66 and whose logo is an apple with a bite missing. Now, with their Apple Vision Pro mixed reality headset, they are tempting you to enter their dystopian end times world. Don't. Make no mistake about it. This is all about transhumanism and the mark of the beast. The first step was by introducing the computer and connecting us online. The second step was having that computer on your person in the form of an iPhone. The third and final step will be to put the technology inside you. The final step started this year when Elon Musk's Neuralink was implanted in the first human. Apple Vision Pro promises godlike power. Imagine a world where you can be all powerful, all knowing, and present everywhere. This will be Satan's realm, where every kind of evil will run unchecked. Where am I? Well, it's a little bit like heaven, only better. Daddy, we miss you. Please, Thor. You can be with us today. Now, all you have to do is give me your pledge of allegiance, and everything you've ever dreamed of will be yours. I would rather believe in a creator who would die for his creation than have his creation die for him. My son. I am not your son, Satan. And they are not my family. So be it. You've made your choice. Not even your God can save you. He already is. The day of wonders. You make the world worship you or die. Pretty soon, everything, this whole earth, will be mine. And there's no reason for God to come back. Now is there? Once they give me the Pledge of Allegiance, they will be mine for eternity. And those that aren't are dead. Lord, I didn't honor you as my life. By your grace, may I do so in death. Oh, very touching. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24:12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. 
Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Now to a tragedy in Minnesota. Three first responders killed after arriving on the scene of a domestic disturbance. This morning we're learning the names of the two police officers and firefighter. Officers got the call for that domestic incident in the middle of the night. Shots were fired at the officers from both the main and upper levels of the home. Overnight, a Minnesota community reeling from the loss of two policemen and a firefighter shot and killed responding to a domestic incident in Burnsville, south of Minneapolis, gathering for a vigil to honor the fallen. We're all grieving and, and we're going to do it together. Police called to the scene about 2 a.m. Sunday, where they say the shooter was barricaded inside with his family, including seven children. This individual had uh, several guns and large amounts of ammunition and shot at the police officers from multiple positions within the home. I need two additional ambulances. Automated calls warning families to shelter in place. Residents like Bridget Stewart shaken. It's a scary situation to have to be told to hunker in place and fall into your basement. After an hours long standoff, the windshield on this armored police vehicle riddled with bullets. Police later determining the suspect died by suicide. The children found safe. Scores of first responders gathering outside Hennepin County Medical Center to salute their lost brothers. Police officers Paul Elmstrand and Matthew Rugge and firefighter paramedic Adam Finsith, who police say were killed by the gunmen. Their bodies transported in a procession to the medical examiner's office. Today's shooting deaths of two police officers and a paramedic in suburban Minneapolis add to a grim toll. So far in 2024, there have been more mass shootings in this country than we've had days of the year. Gunshots, panic on parade in Kansas City, a Super Bowl celebration hijacked, another American moment shattered. I was just crying a lot. Yeah. yeah. You had to have been terrified. Yeah, I was terrified. I was traumatized. With today's gun violence, there is no sacred space. Inside this Houston megachurch last Sunday, a woman stormed in firing an AR-15. She was shot and killed by off-duty police officers after a running gun battle. It's, it's scary. It is. It's scary. On average, more than 325 Americans are shot every day. Last year saw 656 mass shootings, defined as four or more victims. I traveled the world and felt a lot safer there than I did in my own city. We're twitchy, bullet by bullet, gun violence grafts onto everyday stresses. People are experiencing vicarious trauma. Dr. Arthur Evans, CEO of the American Psychological Association. How significant is this stress? We have about a third of people in the country who are saying that their behavior has changed because of mass shootings. Right after mass shootings, Evans says 75% of Americans report significant stress and that parents of young children especially have concerns about their kids' safety. When you're talking about churches and synagogues and shopping malls, we have less of an ability to distance and, and, and I think that has a different kind of impact on us. On the polarizing issue of guns, a majority, 56%, favor more restrictions, according to Gallup. I'm a gun owner. It should be, um, you know, harder for certain individuals to obtain a gun. Owning guns makes millions of Americans feel more in control. But with gun violence, anxiety climbs because people feel they've lost control. Why haven't I got shot? I don't know. Guns in crowds have become a new American anxiety. Kansas City, a reminder of Denver's NBA championship parade last year when two people were shot. People just can't go buy a gun or an assault rifle and go kill people. I mean, like, how many more people have to die before we change that? The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. This morning, students at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, are waking up on edge. UCCS Alpine Village for gunshot victims. After police say two people were gunned down inside a campus dorm room early Friday morning, sending the school into an hours long lockdown. I'm not sure if the scene is safe yet. Police identifying the victims as Colorado residents 26 year old Celie Rain Montgomery, who was not registered with the university, and Samuel Knopp, a 24 year old student. His mom posting on Facebook before authorities confirmed who was killed. There were reports of an active shooter on campus. I haven't heard from Sam, adding, this hits way too close to home. These deaths are being investigated as a homicide, and this continues to be a very active investigation in its very early stages. I still feel really on edge, so I, I feel like a lot of people don't know how they're supposed to be reacting right now. We don't really know if they're still out there, or if they're still on campus, if they're a student, so it's kind of terrifying. Six people are shot, one of them killed at a Waffle House on the west side of Indy. Police say it started as a disturbance between two groups. Gunfire erupted right after 1230 this morning. Police got here and initially found five shooting victims before learning of a sixth victim who showed up at Methodist Hospital in critical condition. One woman who was rushed to Eskenazi Hospital died from her injuries. One other man is in critical condition and the remaining three victims are said to be stable. At this point, police believe that this started as a fight between two groups that escalated into gunfire here at Waffle House. With the horrible mass shootings taking place weekly in the United States, we need to answer the question, why do mass shootings keep happening in America? What does this meaningless violence mean? Will it get worse and worse as the time of Christ's return draws near? If we think that things are going to get better and that mankind will solve this problem for less violence, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible indicates otherwise. The simple answer to why do mass shootings keep happening in America is God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, Engel v. Vital, The removal of prayer in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1963, Abington School District v. Shump, The removal of Bible reading in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1973, Roe v. Wade, legalized abortions by the Supreme Court. Although Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court on June 24, 2022, there have been over 60 million abortions in the United States. 2013, United States v. Windsor. The Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. DOMA stated that one man should be married to one woman. DOMA is biblically supported according to Genesis 2.24, which says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 2015, Overfell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court case that ruled in favor of same-sex marriages. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools. America has made it legal to murder unborn children and has legalized homosexuality in the form of God's sacred institution, marriage. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments, and give him the glory that only he deserves, he has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evil doers. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30:12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. Even by the standards of a region that's subjected to near-daily airstrikes, the attack that happened here several days earlier was particularly shocking. A drone hit a fuel depot that then engulfed a nearby row of houses with a wall of flame. Seven people were killed, including all five members of one family. 
leading to an official period of mourning. Neighbor Alexander tells us he only just got out before the flames reached his house. Now he was back salvaging what possessions he could. We saw the neighbors run out with whatever they were wearing, and we followed soon after. But it was already ablaze out front, so we had to escape through the back. The attacks add to a growing pile of missile and drone scrap being collected for examination, with prosecutors believing some of the missiles now being used have originated from North Korea. The parts have been examined by an interdepartmental group, which includes military experts, who have established they came from North Korea. After months of relentless Russian assaults and admission from Ukraine that it's being forced to pull back some troops from the front lines around Avdivka. It says extra reserves are also being sent in to try to bolster defenses, but there are increasing concerns the town could finally fall to the Russians. The extent of the destruction can be seen in this video, released by a Ukrainian YouTuber, reportedly filmed last week. A district of Avdiivka that has been completely ravaged by Russian bombs. It all happened in the past two weeks. You can't recognize Avdiivka. Particularly, everything has been flattened by bombs. The Russian army spares nobody. Ukraine has been willing to fight these unending battles, making the grim calculation that with Russia losing far more soldiers, they are worth it. But as with the fight for Bakhmut last year, which Kyiv finally gave up, the desire to save Ukrainian lives seems to be more important. And it's been warning for weeks that ammunition shortages because of the holdup of a military aid package in the U.S. Congress could mean Putin will get his wish. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner defending his decision to sound the alarm on the Russian nuclear threat. Here's what he had to say yesterday. Watch this. My concern is that this is kind of like the Chinese spy balloon and the, the administration is kind of hiding perhaps, you know, some inaction. This is about Russia and the administration taking action. And that's what is important. We need to make certain that we avert uh, what could be an international crisis. Secretary of State Antony Blinken reportedly raising the possibility of Russia putting a nuclear weapon in space with its Chinese and Indian counterparts on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference that happened over the weekend. General Arnold Polinaro, General, it's always Wonderful to talk to you, and there's so much going on internationally right now. Let's start with Russia. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of criticism, and that's why Turner was on Meet the Press yesterday. He's defending himself because he's, he, you know, his critics are saying you should not have released this intelligence into the public sphere. You heard his response. What do you say? Mike Turner is one of the most knowledgeable and most experienced national security experts we have in the Congress. He calls it as he sees it, no matter which administration is in power. He had the support of his full intelligence committee in bringing this to the attention of the American people. Look, $17 trillion of the U.S. economy depends on space. We depend on space for financial transactions, Internet. We depend on space for our military capabilities, precision, navigation, and timing. So we should be very concerned. Uh, Anti-satellite weapons concerns have been around since the peak of the Cold War and now have been uh, renewed. And so I think it's a very appropriate uh, for, for focus on this. And this is one of the reasons that the Congress pushed the administration to create uh, the U.S. Warfighting Space Command and the Space Force to be able to hopefully deter uh, our enemies from taking these kind of actions. FBI Director Christopher Wray reportedly warned that China's cyber attacks on U.S. infrastructure are now at a, quote, scale greater than we'd seen before. And Ray says the Chinese hacking network Volt Typhoon's malware could be triggered at any moment, and that would disrupt our infrastructure. So it's not just Russia we've got to worry about in our satellites. It's also cyber attacks from China. Your response? This just points out what we all know and what some of the isolationist tendencies in the far right and the far left of both parties don't understand. There is no more Fortress America. We are not protected by two oceans and relatively safe borders anymore. Our enemies can reach us from space. They can reach us with intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads on top of them. They can reach us from undersea off the East Coast with missiles with warning times in minutes, not hours. The key is deterrence. Today is presidents today. We should remember the lessons of our most prominent national security presidents, George Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan. Washington said to be prepared for war is the most effective means of preserving the peace. Reagan said peace through strength. We are nearly, not nearly 
nearly as prepared as we should be. We're not nearly as strong as we should be. Deterrence is the key. You want to deter war. You want to deter cyber attacks. And we need to beef up in all these capabilities. To be effective, deterrence, you've got to have the capability. It's got to be credible. And our enemies need to understand that we will use it when we need to. The world is more dangerous and turbulent than the peak of the Cold War. And we've got threats from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and global terrorism. And you have to deter these across the board. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind, but his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. Israel is making it clear the world will not plan its future. The cabinet categorically rejected calls for a Palestinian state as a condition for peace. Israeli defense officials say they've defeated Hamas and Khan Yunus. Now they're setting a deadline for the release of the hostages or else they will invade Rafah. Israel's government issued a proclamation rejecting the international community's plan to impose a Palestinian state on Israel. The Knesset is expected to ratify the declaration on Monday. Israel categorically rejects international edicts on a permanent arrangement with the Palestinians. Such an arrangement will be achieved only through direct negotiations between the sides without preconditions. Israel will continue to oppose unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state, recognition such as that following the massacre of October 7th will grant a major prize to terror, a prize that has not been seen before and will prevent any future peace arrangement. In Gaza, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant says 200 militants surrendered at Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis. We can say today that the Khan Yunis Brigade has been defeated. The Khan Yunis Brigade is no longer functioning as a military entity in any way. War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz warned if Israeli hostages aren't returned by the beginning of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan in mid-March, Israel will press forward into the Rafah area. To those saying the price is too high, I say very clearly, Hamas has a choice. They can surrender, release the hostages, and this way the citizens of Gaza can celebrate the holy holiday of Ramadan. Meanwhile, Israel condemned comments by Brazil's president comparing the war in Gaza to the Holocaust. Today, the president of Brazil, by comparing Israel's war in Gaza against Hamas, a genocidal terrorist organization, to the Holocaust, President Silva has disgraced the memory of six million Jews murdered by the Nazis, and he's demonized the Jewish state like the most virulent anti-Semite. He should be ashamed of himself. Genesis 16, 1 through 12. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. 
And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Genesis chapter 16 began a prophecy about the baby Hagar is carrying. It is a boy, and she is to call him Ishmael. The rest of the prophecy is less favorable. Even though Ishmael will be the first son born to Abram through the Gentile maidservant Hagar, God's promises went to Isaac, Abram's second born, with his true wife Sarai. Though Ishmael will become a great nation, his people will live in conflict with everyone just as we are witnessing today. His hand will be against everyone and everyone will be against him. He will live in hostility to his kinsmen. We learn that Ishmael's descendants become the Arabic people. These cultures have been at odds with the Jewish people for millennia. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. Israeli President Isaac Herzog met with the Qatari Prime Minister on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference about securing the release of more than 130 hostages still in Hamas hands in Gaza. Family members of the hostages accompanied Herzog to the conference. Herzog also showed a book found by the IDF in Gaza and written by Hamas co-founder and former Palestinian Authority Foreign Minister Dr. Mahmoud al-Zahar. The End of the Jews depicts swords and daggers piercing stars of David and Jews drowning in a sea of blood. The book mainly hails the fact that, first of all, they, we should not recognize the fact that there are Jews and Jewish people, but most predominantly it hails the Holocaust. It hails what the Nazis have done and calls for nation to follow what the Nazis have done. In The Hague today, hearings opened on the legality of Israel's so-called occupation of lands sought for a Palestinian state. That would include Gaza, as well as biblical Judea and Samaria, where more than a half a million Israeli Jews live. God gives the most dire warning to the nations who would divide up his land, as we read in Joel 3, 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Warnings of war in the north were heard from both Israeli and Hezbollah leaders. At the same time, despite a week of deadly exchanges, both sides say they would rather avoid a full-scale war. And I'll Steve Leibovich.
reports. The rhetoric of coming war with Hezbollah is rising. There have been numerous warnings to Hezbollah of what will happen if they continue their cross-border aggressions against Israel since the start of the war with Gaza. Israel remains open to the idea of a negotiated agreement in the north while preparing for war. Thousands in South Lebanon attended the funeral of Ali al-Debs, a commander in Hezbollah's elite Radwan unit who was targeted and killed in an Israeli strike in Nabatia. This triggered a series of rockets fired into Israel in retaliation. In a speech from his bunker in Beirut, Hezbollah leader Nasrallah said Israel would pay a price in blood for its recent attacks. Cross-border Hezbollah attacks have taken place daily since the start of the war in Gaza. Israel has responded by striking Hezbollah targets with deadly accuracy all over South Lebanon, killing some 200 Hezbollah fighters. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Are you discerning the times? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.